This is a Senior Preaching Week, and tomorrow will be our last day with Jeremiah showing up tomorrow, we hope, and we hope that many of you will show up tomorrow <laughs> as well. Um, the, the, the last day, Friday, tends to be a, a lighter day. If you at all can plan to be here, uh, we would encourage that, and Jeremiah would be happy to see your face. Today, our senior preacher is Dean Paul Hart. Uh, Dean Paul was born in Jamaica, moved to Atlanta, and has come to us from Atlanta as he maintains connection with his family and his family business. When he graduates, he plans to go back to Atlanta and take responsibility for that family business and to merge a ministry into marketing and merchandising for that family business, which already has a specific ministry component in it. Uh, if you don't know about that, it would be worth taking a few minutes to get to know Dean Paul and what his family business is about. Uh, he will be careful with his family to spend some time investing in refreshment in the life-giving ongoing work of the Spirit in their lives, and he will be talking about that today. His wife, Nikki, is here with us today, as is Victoria and Nicholas, his children, and I'll ask them to stand because they're an important part of his life and an important part of his ministry. They have been welcomed into my preaching class on many occasions when Dean Paul has preached. Uh, when we asked Dean Paul what he enjoyed about preaching, he said it was the privilege of taking God's life-changing truth, bringing it to a specific audience with a specific relevance to them for the goal of life change for the glory of God. And I think he's listened well to, <laughs> to, to what we are uh, hoping for along the way. Uh, his most, uh, among many, his most influential moment was uh, coming back from a theology class in which Scott Horrell was teaching about the Trinity and that night presenting to his family the challenge for them to work together in loving, caring relationship with one another that reflects the work of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit in harmony. And so I think we are looking forward to a message this morning that can change and refresh us. Good morning. I want to tell you this is an incredible privilege, and I am humbled and grateful to be here. Um, before I jump into a message, Joe, I want to thank my sweet wife, Nikki. Uh, I want to thank my children, Victoria and Nicholas. Uh, when we came here, we came trusting that the Lord was leading us to do this together. You know, some people have said to me, I can't imagine doing seminary with a wife and kids. And I will tell you, I can't imagine doing seminary without my wife and kids. I love you greatly and I appreciate you being here and all that you mean to me and we look forward to seeing what God's gonna do next. Uh, to the faculty that are spread out here, I wanna thank you for your investment really in my life and I pray that the Lord will uh, allow you to enjoy fruit that bears in my life and that I'm faithful as well as in my companions in ministry here uh, uh, that we continue to strive to serve the Lord. It was March 2010 when my family uh, began to have some discussions and my wife and I came out here to DTS for a two-day focus event. It would give us an opportunity to see if I was to study at Dallas Seminary. Near the end of the last day, it was Dr. Bob Garippa that said, if you wanna come to seminary to get a degree and to get more Bible knowledge so you can go into ministry, please go somewhere else. But he said, if you want to study the word of God so that it'll change your life, that it will adjust your marriage and your family, that it will impact those that you minister to now and in the future, then Dallas Seminary is the place to come. I remember sitting out there and praying, Lord Jesus, I want you to refresh and to renew and to restore my life, my marriage, my family, 
those that I'm acquainted with now and those in the future. Well, as Paul Harvey says, you know the rest of the story. In two weeks, I'll be graduating, and we're looking forward to that time. And yet, through all of this time, uh, as I've studied God's word, I've read more than I ever thought I would read. (laughs) We have discussed every book and every author in the Bible. And yet, the sum of my time here has been falling in love with the God of the Bible. You see, the word of God are God's words, and when he speaks, we're able to find out more about who he is and who we are. People ask me about studying sometimes and I tell them I am chipping away at an iceberg of a God that I'll be studying for the rest of my life. But you see, there's a challenge in that because you and I, we wanna know everything. And God is infinite and yet we are finite. And that's tough for us because you and I long for certainty. We wanna understand what's next, whether that's in two weeks after graduation, whether that's in 54 weeks, or whether it's longer. God, what do you have next? And our challenge is we wonder, God, can I accept your plan and your will for my life? Because I really want you to do things the way I see it. We worry and we wonder What's gonna happen? And because of this, we become restless. And restlessness is an issue for all of us. I can tell you in January of this year, my wife and I got news that we were expecting our fourth child. We were excited by the news. And yet, all of a sudden, there was this restlessness that gripped us because 18 months before, we had had a miscarriage and we lost our third child. You see, restlessness is a part of life for all of us. And so this morning, I want us to look at how do we deal with restlessness? How do you and I remove restlessness from our lives? The text we'll be in today is John chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 5 to 15. Now, this is a familiar text to you about the Samaritan woman, but I want to remind you about John's purpose when he writes He tells us in John 20, 31, it is so that you would believe first that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and second, that believing you would have life in his name. In John chapter four, we're gonna find that Jesus offers more than is expected. Because you know the story, I'm just gonna give you three points. We're gonna look first off at recognition. The second point will be After recognition, restlessness, that which we struggle with. And the third point will be a challenge or a response for us. Recognition, restlessness, and then a response. So let's begin with recognition. A failure to recognize the gift of God and the giver results in repetitive thirst. Let me say that again. A failure to recognize the gift of God and the giver results in repetitive thirst. As we look in the Bible, we turn to John 4, 5, and verses 5 to 9 are going to give us the background. So he came to a town of Samaria, this is Jesus, called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Very quickly we get the setting that a tired Jesus has been traveling from Judea, and he comes now to this town in Samaria. Important to what we're going to establish today is where Jesus sits. If you would, look at verse six, and we find there two occurrences of the word well. I'm gonna ask you to underline that. Jacob's well, and he sat beside the well. That's about midday. A woman comes out from Samaria. He asks her for water, and she's thrown off because she recognizes he's Jewish. And John tells us Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So we continue reading. Verse nine, verse 10. Jesus answered to her and he said, 
If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now, what Jesus says is unique here. It's a second class condition in the Greek. It implies that there's a negation here. In other words, he says, if you knew the gift of God, but you don't. And if you knew who was speaking to you, but you don't, you would have asked me for living water and I would have given it to you. The Samaritan woman goes on and she shows she doesn't get what he's saying. Look with me in verse 11. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get or keep that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and he drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. In her assessment, Jesus, you can't be talking about Jacob's well. It's too deep and you don't have a bucket. So what are you talking about? Again, in the Greek, she starts off and she shows she's got her own negative response. She says, you're not greater than Jacob, are you? You can't be. We've had this well running for 1,800 years. His family drank from it. Are, are, are you greater than this one? You can't be. So where do you get this living water? Jesus is about to give her something more than she ever expected. Look with me at verse 13. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Jesus says, there's a problem with this water. It doesn't satisfy thirst. Remember, they've already had 1,800 years of proof. They're used to going back to the well. But he's going to offer a water that is different. Using the strongest negative that the Greek holds, he's going to say, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst, but the one who drinks of the water I give him will, ume, never be thirsty again. Dr. Dan Wallace on our staff says ume is used to grant uh, uh, the negative of a certainty. Now, we've heard Jesus say this at other parts in John. In John 28, he says, I give unto them eternal life and they will, ume, never perish. In John 11:26, 26, he says, everyone that lives and believes in me will, ume, never perish. This is some special water that Jesus is talking about. Now, we're going to find out about the water. I want you to turn over a couple chapters to John 7. In John 7, 37 to 39, we find out that the living water is the spirit which had not yet been given. John 7, 37, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Turn back with me to John 4, and let's look at that last verse. The woman hears, you've got special water. I won't have to come here again. And she says in verse 15, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. You see, our Lord Jesus offers spiritual refreshment. The woman had a physical thirst, but she had something deeper. And as Jesus always does, he takes a physical illustration to make a spiritual point. Now, God has wired all of humanity with the need for water. If we don't have it for three days, the average person will die. Therefore, thirst tells us we've got a need. This woman had tried to satisfy her thirst. We'll find out later. She had multiple relationships, but nothing was satisfying. So you see, as an evangelistic passage, John 4 says that Jesus offers the spirit for salvation to meet the lasting longing need of every person on the face of the earth. But John is doing something more in the passage here. There's six occurrences in John that he blends ume and the phrase aiston iona, never and forever, sometimes translated again here. We've seen three of those. When Jesus said, if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again, 
Never and again is never and forever. In John 10, 28, that I give unto them eternal life and they will never perish, never ume, perish again, Iona forever. In John eleven twenty six, 26, everyone that lives and believes in me will never perish, never ume, Iona forever. You remember that John has a purpose here that is to deliver to everyone that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's justification. But John also goes on and says that sanctification is real in the life of the believer so that believing you may have life in his name. It's John that says Jesus offers the abundant life. It's John who records Jesus' statement in John 15 about abiding in the Spirit so that you can continue to grow. So just like we can have a physical thirst, we can continue to have a spiritual thirst? No. Follow what he's saying. Whereas I will die, this body can fail, but I have eternal life, I can still have physical thirst and yet be spiritually satisfied. But you see, I believe that for the majority of us, we already know that the giver is Jesus Christ and the gift of God is the Spirit. And so a failure to recognize the, the gift of God and the giver results in repetitive thirst. But see, you and I still suffer thirst from time to time, physically and emotionally. Although we've recognized it, it still shows up. So where does this continued thirst show up in your life and mine? One of the ways that thirst shows up for the believer is restlessness. One of the ways that thirst shows up for the believer is restlessness. Remember, God is infinite and we're finite and we don't have all the answers. I can remember it was my second semester here at DTS. That's when I first hit syllabus shock. Uh, three, four weeks into chapel, I remember walking out going, Lord, I can't do this. And feeling as it was, the Spirit of God said, you're right, you can't. <laughs> but I can help you. You know, my mom always, often asks me, she says, how do you remember everything you're reading and studying? I said, that's not my job. My job is to do the work and I'm gonna trust that the Spirit will bring me back to all truth and remind me of what I've learned. Can I tell you that Nikki and I love the Lord Jesus? We know that the Spirit is the gift and the giver is Jesus. And yet as the pregnancy progressed and red flags began to throw themselves up at the same point as the first miscarriage, we became restless. We wanted answers. One of the ways that, restless, that thirst shows up for you and I is restlessness. So what do we do about restlessness? My brothers and sisters, allow the Spirit of God to refresh you with the word of God. Allow the spirit of God to refresh you with the word of God. Remember, it's God that has provided spiritual refreshment. Both the father and the son will find in a second, send the spirit to refresh us. And he refreshes us with the word. Now, let me go back to this image again. When I'm thirsty, as I am now, my mouth gets dry. <laughs> I look for water to drink and I expect it to satisfy my thirst. Similarly, when I'm dealing with something that's physical or emotional, the spirit has the ability and the capacity to satisfy that thirst. Uh, let's talk about the spirit because he was given for a reason. If you would turn over to John 14, 26. In John 14, 26, we're gonna read this. But the helper the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And he'll bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. See, the Spirit's job is to bring to us all things and to bring us back to the word of God. When you and I are restless, we need the Spirit of God to refresh us with the word of God. Look at the next chapter, chapter 15, verse 26. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. 
You see, the spirit of God is the spirit of truth. And when I'm restless, I need a strong dose of truth because I get stuck in the what ifs of life. But we find out more in chapter 16, verse 13, we read this. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. And then look at John 17, 17. This is the strongest verse that we have for the inerrancy of the scripture It says, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. You see, the spirit brings us to truth. Now I know you're wondering, then where does John 4 connect in all of this? I'm gonna ask you, go back to John 4 one more time. In John 4, we read the woman's concern in verse 11. She said, sir, you have nothing to draw the water with and the well is deep. I want you to circle well there. I want you to look in verse 12 and circle where it says, he gave us the well. You see, the woman uses a word there in the Greek that is freyar. Freyar is a well that is dug deep. It speaks to the accomplishment of man and what man is doing. But when we get down to verse 14, where Jesus says, whoever drinks of the water that I'll give him, now I want you to underline where you see well or spring or fountain in verse 14. Jesus uses the same word that John used up ahead in verse six. It is the Greek word pege. Pege speaks of the source. You dig a well or a frayer to get to the pege, the source. Jesus says, I'm not another well digger, I'm the source giver. So when you and I allow the spirit of God to teach us from the word of God, It's not about us digging and looking. It's the well bubbling up and saying, Lord, you know what I need in this moment of restlessness. Would you satisfy me with spiritual refreshment? You see, I saw this and I still see this lived out in our family's life. Uh, My wife is a member of Bible Study Fellowship International, phenomenal organization that has had a pivotal role in our family's life. And I watched as she would share with me her struggle with restlessness through the pregnancy. And I know my presence helped, but when she studied in Numbers 11, and she came to the children of Israel grumbling to Moses and saying, hey, we want meat to eat. The Lord's response is, is the Lord's arm too short? And it was the word of God that encouraged Nikki for that week. The next week, seeing the red flags again, she worried. And she said, Dean, I'm struggling with restlessness. She turned and studied Numbers 13. And with a negative report from the spies, Caleb stands up and says, whether everyone's against us, nothing is impossible with our God. And she was encouraged by God's word. The spirit of God refreshes us with the word of God. Can I tell you that's why I know it's true that when we lost our fourth child, our baby girl, Asher. Four Monday nights ago, it has been the Spirit of God that has refreshed us with the Word of God. We don't have all the details. We don't know all of God's plan. But the Word of God is true. And it teaches us that God is good and that we can trust Him, whether we have all the details or not, and that certainty is found in our faith and our God. Allow the Spirit of God to refresh you with the Word of God. In summary, I want to remind you that a failure to recognize the gift of God and the giver will result in repetitive thirst. But we really have that down. And yet, when we wrestle with restlessness, allow the Spirit of God to refresh you with the Word of God. Now, let me let you in on a little secret about me. I am so excited to know that I am finite and God is infinite, that I don't need to have all of the answers and all of the details, that I can trust our God that he is good and that he is true. In my first semester here, Dr. J. Smith spoke in chapel and he read a quote concerning uh, Albert Einstein by Charles Meisner, an American physicist from the University of Maryland. And he said this, 
Einstein must have looked at what the preachers said about God and felt that they were blaspheming. He had seen much more majesty than they had ever imagined, and they were just not talking about the real thing. That is why Einstein had so little use for organized religion, although he strikes me as a basically very religious man. Dr. J concluded, we have domesticated the Almighty, and we stand under the indictment of Albert Einstein. In my four years here at Dallas Seminary, I've served as a husband and a dad, as a son, as a brother, as a student, as a friend, as a teacher, as an employee. There have been long days, and there have been many long nights. Challenges have come from within, and they've come from without. Yet you and I stay in the word of God in our classes and outside of our classes because we have our moments of restlessness. And yet the abundant life means that we don't have to remain restless forever. 